You're listening to The Business Communicators, presented by IABC Houston. And now, your hosts, Austin Stenton, Hattie Horn, and Thomas Bain. Welcome to Season 3, Episode 18 of The Business Communicators, a podcast presented by IABC Houston. My name is Austin Staten, joined alongside my wonderful co-host, the best in the business, that's Hattie Horn and Thomas Bain, on this journey as we explore the key issues and trends that impact us as communicators. And uh, first off, we want to thank everyone for joining IBC Houston and the Business Communicators last Thursday as Chris Brogan joined us for a wonderful webinar. Uh, where it was just off the record, basically conversation, real talk. And uh, we hope that all of you enjoyed it. And you might, if you did join, notice that we did do a giveaway. And the giveaway was for a lighting kit, which Thomas has on his screen right now, and a journal, which I do not have by me right now, uh, but was thanks to our partnership with Staples and True Red uh, from January of this year. But we had 10 entries live during the webinar with Chris Brogan, and we randomly selected a winner. Wow. Can we get a drum roll? Can we get a drum roll, please? And the winner is Carol Miner. Woohoo! So, congratulations, Carol. We will send you a text here shortly back on our app, and uh, we will get your contact information and mail out your prize kit. But if you want to potentially win more prizes or follow the work that we're doing, just text 713-360-0133. Just text podcast 713-360-0133. Of course, follow us on all of our social media channels as well. Just search at Biz Communicator or subscribe to our website, thebusinesscommunicators.com. But Thomas Hattie, it's it's uh, it's been a, a great week. I'm sorry that uh, Thomas, your your Texas Tech Red Raiders didn't make it into the Sweet 16, but you know my Baylor Bears still going strong. Hopefully, by the time you're listening to this, they're still going strong. But how's everything on your end, Thomas? Everything on my end's going good. It's you know it's it's been been a whirlwind to say the least uh, the last couple weeks and just having a grand old time. Um, you know, still my brackets are still held and strong. I need Baylor and Gonzaga to make it in the final and. Depending on who, if another team bounces out, I might be winning no matter who wins the game well, on, the, I, on the championship. Yeah, my bracket is toast. It's not in good shape. But uh, Hattie, how's everything on your end going? What's new? I'm good. I had no brackets, but I think I watched so many games, and it was just really interesting to see some of the upsets. No, it wasn't. It was I was it was just so many of them, but I thought it was also interesting that when Baylor was playing their games and I did watch them, I really expected a lot more out of them because the teams that they were playing, it's like they knew they were going to win, so they played like, oh, I'm going to do a little bit for a while. So I expect more out of them. Hey, they covered the Coming spread. Up. They covered the spread against Wisconsin. That's all that you can ask if you're a sports better or a fan. They say that great teams win or good teams win. Great teams cover, and Baylor covered. So we could say that Baylor is a great team. So we'll see what happens with the rest of March Madness. I mean, who knows? By the time you're listening to this episode, my Baylor Bears could be out of the tournament. I hope that's not the case, but I hope that's anything not can the happen. case either. I hope that's not the case either. I'm not, <laughs> you know, I'm not biased or anything. I just like seeing good basketball. Oh, and, for sure. Um, I, it's just I, I was just cracking up, especially when it comes to free throws. These teams need more <laughs> Horrible. practice. Oh my Horrible. goodness. <laughs> But I'll tell you what, it was fun texting with uh, you and Thomas last Friday night, <laughs> really throughout the entire day until the games, the final games ended at like midnight. Like midnight, yeah. It, it, but yeah. I enjoyed it. I enjoyed yeah, it. Yeah, so, it was fun. Lots of fun. I think I, I think I made this uh, joke in our text thread, but uh, Katie, my fiance, uh, you know, she w- she asked if she could, you know, you know, she was like, hey, is it cool if I go grab dinner with a friend or something like that? And I was like... Yes, absolutely. Go ahead. That means I get to watch March Madness all day. So this is great news. Yeah, absolutely. But anyways, I know that it's a big week for both of you as you had your Pfizer vaccine just about two and a half weeks ago. And we spoke about this on the podcast. You can watch our video on LinkedIn and YouTube where we kind of discuss our reactions getting the COVID-19 vaccine. So both of you are due for your second dose of the Pfizer vaccine this week. Uh, Me, on the other hand, I have Moderna, so I am due for the second dose next week. I believe April 8th is the date that I'll get that. But have you guys seen the headlines 
where brands are really stepping in and encouraging Americans to get the vaccine and some of the giveaways that they're doing. I mean, Krispy Kreme, if you if you can show up with the proof, your vaccine card, you can get a free donut per week for the rest of the year. And if you live in Michigan, there's a dispensary, I think in the Detroit area, that is giving free marijuana away to people <laughs> who show up with a proof of vaccine. I mean, it's 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 wild to me, all of these giveaways and, that brands are doing. But I, I'm curious from your take, is this a good communications tactic to potentially get more people vaccinated? Or is this just a publicity stunt that is incredibly well done? I want to say, first off, before, Texas is now going, all adults are able to get vaccinated. So if you can, please do it. I know other states are doing the same. So please do that, just starting off. Um, second and foremost, living in Texas, I think i got to say it. Shit, please. Come on, Shipley's, get on board here. Yeah, Shipley's Donuts, and, and they just, I think, recently sold out, too, didn't they? To, like, a big investor? I don't know if it's in Texas or not, but... Hattie, what's your take? Is this a good strategy? I think it's it's almost like um, giving your kid an allowance for cleaning their room. Um, <laughs> and they still live in your house. Uh, so it should be part of their responsibility anyway, because it's your house, too. And, and they're so 35. I kind of I compare that... Uh, to that because if this is about keeping yourself safe, keeping your family safe, you shouldn't have to give me an incentive to do that's incentive enough. But unfortunately, this hasn't been the case. But it also goes back to people still skeptical about this entire virus. I mean, the vaccine and not sure, you know, the safety of it. And it puts it on the onus also back on folks who the to make sure that people understand the what it is what this virus what the vaccine is about how safe it is promote that type of information keep building on that so it's almost like oh let me just dangle this little sled here i'm going to give you 25 cents if you go do this now if you get this so I don't know if it would have made me do it anymore if I were a kid. Well, yeah, it probably would have. But it's unfortunate that that has to happen. But if it works, okay. It's a it's a win win for everybody all the way around. I think it's a publicity stunt by by the vendors. You know, hey, we need to grab headlines any way possible. Krispy Kreme gives away a free hot donut every time their lights on, so you can drive through and get a free donut from that way. This is just another way to do it. I do question. Some of the, the the companies that are doing it. So so Krispy Kreme, one of the underlying health factors is obesity. Donuts, obesity. Um, a marijuana dispensary, you know, while they said COVID smokers were doing better because they were used to not having oxygen in their lungs. <laughs> but but at the same token, um, it, it's kind of like that. Is, is it's, I, and I'm not going to knock dispensaries by any stretch of the imagination because I don't know enough about them being in texas but at the same token are are these giveaways healthy i do tend to agree with you thomas that i i do think it's more of a publicity stunt and these companies are one doing their part and at least saying you know you should you should get a vaccine and i think any incentive for people to get a vaccine is good because that means the, the quicker the the economy can reopen um you know someone wants to give me a free krispy kreme Count, count me in. I'm, I'm oh, in. If I'm driving, I, if I'm driving through, <laughs> driving by, and I see a Krispy Kreme, I'm gonna be like, "Don't it sounds really good? I'm gonna stop." I'm, I saw, I'm a I saw there were three locations, diet. three locations in Houston. So I might be doing a Krispy Kreme tour each week, just going from one location to the next. But it is interesting to look at the vaccine rollout overall and the communications efforts behind it. And we kind of touched on this probably two months ago on the podcast on whether the good of the vaccines, like the efficacy rate was actually being communicated properly. And there was a New York Times piece last week that kind of suggested that the media sentiment has been negative and almost downplaying, uh, you know, any positive COVID news that comes out. And then, you know, we've seen the issues with the rollout to the vaccine in Europe, you know, AstraZeneca, uh, they did a great job with the vaccine with Oxford, but from a communication standpoint, they've really, really messed up, you know, confusing some of the efficacy numbers, uh, you know, having the, the, the blood clot situation surrounding it. 
and so it's it's it seems like you know the science is good the science is good the vaccines are effective but just kind of overall whether it's the media whether it's some of these companies the communication element from the vaccine rollout has been less than desirable society as a whole we pick and choose what kind of media or what stories we want to listen to um you know hey Austin, i love your opinion but it's not mine so what you're saying is not right um and, and we see that happening with the media nowadays so so i think that there needs to be the, the pendulum needs to come back to where to where people will start to trust the media you know that fair and unbalanced for lack of a better statement um and some of it, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna kind of play devil's advocate and lean a little bit onto the different uh, producers, the Pfizer's, the Moderna's, the AstraZeneca's, because this is really in crisis. So they were making things on the fly, and at the end of the day, their main goal was to create the the the, the vaccine, not have a, have a rollout plan for it. You know, yes, with these mega mega companies that you know bring in millions and billions of dollars a year. Yes, their communications team should have been doing a better job, but at the end of the day, the companies themselves did what they were supposed to do. Well, yeah, they did what they were supposed to do, but you you can't have one without the other. You can't Agreed. say, hold on, you can't say that the company did their job and then on the in another breath say, oh, but the media, we need to be able to trust them to get the right information. The company has to give the media the right information to communicate in the first place. So it just goes hand in hand. So why should I trust what either one of you have to say? Just just put it out there. Because if you also think about it, it was something that Austin said a few seconds ago, or a few minutes ago, in terms of all of the information that we've gotten about this uh, vaccine has, uh, has always been negative. It's always been about the rise. The numbers are continuing to rise versus the efficacy or I get that word wrong all the time of the vaccines itself. We're hearing more about there's there's still a rise here. There's still a rise. So you've got to have some sort of strategy better that is helping us understand that the rates for this vaccine are so much better and can reduce the number of hospitalizations uh, the safety of it. That's what we need to hear more of, but it's going to take the companies. They have to take some responsibility for letting, get, giving this information out or making sure that it's also getting out as well. Yeah. There's been a few publications that have done a good job of showing like the charts. Uh, you know, the New York times each, each day they send out like a vaccine tracker, show how many cases there are in the U S how many, you know, what the R rate is. Um, and then I think 538 has also done a good job as well. And there's a few others that I can't think of off the top of my head on Twitter. Um, but they've showed the countries that have been vaccinated, you know, that high, have the higher vaccine rates, like the United States, like Israel, like the UK. Uh, and you can definitely see the curve s- fall down. Like it's it's almost like a nosedive as the vaccines go up. So I think that is, is a extreme positive. But then they also show the charts of, the rest of the EU, for example, and Latin America, who don't have the same vaccine rates as we do in the United States. And the cases are still going up. There are still lockdowns happening in some of these countries. And so I think that needs to be communicated more broadly, at least to but the- they also, But they also need to tell people why. A lot of these, exactly. people, these countries don't have access to the vaccine as well. Right, right. But, but they need to say that. Right, but I, I, think, I think part of it is there's there's a lot of people who are still skeptical here in the United States on whether the vaccine will actually work. And I think the science is proving that the vaccine is working. But the problem is, is you still have people saying, oh, well, person so-and-so who had the vaccine ended up testing positive. And it, it's like, well, we know that the vaccine is 95% effective if you get the Pfizer. So there are going to be some smaller cases. But what they're not telling you is that person who tested positive is asymptomatic. They're not being hospitalized. They don't really have bad symptoms. And that just, again, goes to show that the vaccine is helping out. So that message needs to be clearly communicated. And that takes a full 360-degree effort from the government, the media, and the companies 
and everyone needs to step up to do their part to, you know, help reopen the, the global economy. There's also a frequency around that, too. They're not saying that as frequent enough. Exactly. So, so the challenge comes into play is, is you're talking to the media, getting the message out there through the traditional channels, um, your, your big newspapers, your big television ads. They're in the business to make money and sell ads. When I was doing public relations, there was a statement, if it bleeds, it leads, meaning that, you know, unfortunately, the negative news is what moves the needle on their sales, their ad revenue, everything in between. So telling a rosy story, everything's, you know, sunshine and puppies and rainbows doesn't, you might sell one day, but it's not going to go over the long term. Um, so so, so it, it does need to be fair and balanced. That goes back to that statement about the media being fair and balanced. They're in the business to sell papers. They're in the business to get viewers. They're in the business to get advertising dollars. Um, and so, and so, is that the broken system with it? You know, uh, I think last week there was uh, another round of hearings um, with Twitter and Facebook and Google or Alphabet on Capitol Hill, where the senators were asking, "Does does your platform really move the needle? Yes or no?" And of course, all of them were like dodging around the answers because they're still investigating the whole um, Capitol right stuff. But Jack Dort. Uh, the CEO of Twitter, Jack Dorsey, um, tweeted out, question mark, yes or no. And one of the senators says, hey, which is winning? Like they, they, he was trying to troll them and they wound up trolling him back. And it was yes. And so so is it the media's responsibility to fair and balance? Yes. Is it the company's responsibility to fair and balance? Yes. But then it's also us as a society to make sure that we're not spreading the misinformation on the social media platforms because – we're seeing time and time again that while they are censoring, it's not near the, the thing it is. The, you can only spread what you have. Yeah. Yeah. And, <laughs> COVID. It, and, 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 that, and that falls on communicators. Any good information, any good data that you have, shout it loud and clear. Let people exactly. know. Exactly. Use all the channels the way they're supposed to be used. Don't, don't recan the same message for every single possible channel medium. And if, you, if you see negative news, call it out. Yeah. Call it out. I mean, that that's what you would do if it was your business in the media that was, you know, maybe had a negative light. You would reach out to that reporter, have an introductory conversation, go from there. I mean, correct the record. But it's going to be uh, interesting to see what other bribes come our way for the vaccine. You know, maybe... Incentives. Maybe incentives, whatever you want to call it. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm hoping there's an incentive, like if you prove you're vaccinated... Your student loan just go away. That would be nice. <laughs> that that's what I'm talking about. That's not a bri- that's good. That's a reward. <laughs> or 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 maybe you know if you uh, if you get your vaccines, then you get like a free United round trip ticket, something like that. I don't know. I'm just spitballing here. Uh, if you want to, if you want to throw any travel uh, incentives, see, I'm with that. I'm, I'm with that because I don't care about no donut. <laughs> All inclusive to you know Tahiti, Bora Bora, Overwater Bungalow. So Tahiti tourism, please reach just, out to the t- business t- communicator. We're looking for sponsors, <laughs> and we'll have to test that one out first. Yeah, we will so come to a podcast in your country at your resort if you are interested. So yes. let us know. Uh, just shoot us an email, podcast at ibchouston.com, or hit us up on social media. That's the best way to get in touch. But, uh, guys, I don't know if you saw the uh, the Wall Street Journal story on Friday where Ben Mullen, who is a, uh, a reporter, broke the news about sports media outlet The Athletic, which I'm a huge fan of, and Axios, who is a new startup that we've discussed many times on this podcast with their smart brevity. In fact, our first guest on the podcast on season one, episode one, was Sarah Fisher, who is the, uh, the media reporter for Axios. Uh, apparently, according to Benjamin Mullen, Wall Street Journal, The Athletic, their chief executive, Alex Mather, actually approached Axios about a potential merger. And so deals are underway to potentially merge uh, the two platforms. Uh, Talks are still early. Details on finances have not been mentioned. But it's reported that uh, both the companies will continue to operate as distinct digital properties, even with their own journalists and editorial products, according to a source familiar with the deal. But this, to me, is very, very interesting. So The Athletic has been around for a few years. And if you're not familiar with The Athletic, it's a it basically has like a who's who of sports journalists. Like every single relevant sports journalist over the last decade now seems to work for The Athletic. You know, they've been lauded for their coverage. One of the things that kind of separates them is it's a subscription model. You pay 
you know, anywhere from like $1.99 to $3 a month. And in return, you get access to a beautiful app where you can customize it to your city, your teams, your coverage, things that you're interested in. You can follow certain reporters. Uh, and in exchange, you don't get ads. You don't get the pop-up ads that you would have from most websites. You don't get bombarded with, you know, promotional email. And I think it's been great. It's been absolutely wonderful. Axios, on the other hand, is a new startup based in Washington, D.C. that has its its roots with Politico. Uh, I believe they started probably, what, 2017, 2018. It's a really interesting model. And rather than giving, like, long-form journalism, like you would see in, like, The New Yorker or The New York Times, they're giving you the news in probably 300 words or less. So you can read the headlines, figure out what you need to know, and they spell it out for you. They will literally have headlines that say why it matters, what's next, dig deeper. And I think this is interesting, but one of the differences between Axios and The Athletic is Axios partners a lot with big brands, big corporations. You know, they've been sponsored. They have sponsored newsletters that go out from like Facebook, from Shell, from Exxon, from all of these different companies. On the athletics model, that that isn't the case. So, Hattie, I'm going to start with you. Is it good? Is it a good idea to maybe see a potential merger between two innovative companies in the sports media world and then the general news media world? Is it good to maybe explore this merger? Is it good for consumers or is it just good for potentially these two companies? The way you spell it out, it does sound good. I had never heard of The Athletic until you mentioned it. And I went on the website. I looked at it. Looks very strong. I I am a fan of Axios, and I do read them every day. I looked on the Twitter feed (laughs) when this story was announced, and the fans or the subscribers of The Athletic are actually threatening to um, stop their subscriptions. They don't like it. Uh, I haven't had enough information to really say, ooh, this is a good deal. It sounds good. But as you say, they're each on completely different spheres. Um, Axios depends on brands. Um, The other depends on subscriptions from, you know, really, really diehard sports fans. And, uh, but they also kind of uh, display their information similar. So right now, I don't know that it's going to be a good deal, but I do know that they're both innovative. They're both uh, giving their fans what they want or their readers what they want in terms of content and information. Yeah, and just just more insights on The Athletic really quickly. The company, uh, as of September, has over 1 million subscribers. Um, they pay an average of $64 a year for a subscription. So The Athletic is getting about $60 million a year just on subscription cost. Uh, and they've got a lot of backing from like angel investors. Uh, and so they haven't really been hit hard as much during COVID-19 as other companies because they don't rely on like ad revenue. Um, they did have some layoffs last year. I think 8% of their staff uh, was let go, but they are rapidly expanding. You know, it was just a few cities originally that they were supporting and then they decided to do national coverage. Now they're expanding to Europe. I think they, you know, they cover Formula One. They cover the Premier League, the Champions League. Uh, so it is a really interesting model. But Thomas, what, what's your take on this? As long as they continue to report, um, I'm good. You see that you see the mergers of lots of different media outlets um, uh, around the world. I think Jeff Bezos owns a lot of them as well, um, and, and it doesn't really come out until it's there. The Athletic, I heard about it, but I never really did research until um, you know Austin. You mentioned it recently. Um, and, and while they don't have the traditional advertising model like Axios does, I'm not 100% convinced that they're not doing more of the subliminal advertising, taking in the sponsorship. Because just on their website page today, um, their first picture is Nike. Nike soccer ball, Nike shoes. You scroll down a little bit more, um, there, was an, there was some Nike NFL jerseys. You scroll down a little bit more. There was the Nike spokesperson, and and once you start to get further down into it, do you start to see an Adidas Adidas logo? So 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 this might be just me being tinfoil hat wearing, 
But there, there could be some advertising dollars that are coming in from the back of it. It's just not as in your face as the consumer, as here's the pop-up ad that you got to click through them all. Fair, but they, they also cover sports. And Nike, right here, is a big sponsor of the NFL, Major League Baseball, and the NBA. All of those teams are required to wear Nike. Um, so you're going to see that pr- primarily and adidas i mean if you look at the market share between like adidas under armor and nike it's nike's clearly ahead of the pack especially oh, with all their blinking. all their brand deals so i don't know that the athletics getting a cut i think that's just like a coincidence and a byproduct of the sports that they cover but but at the end of the day as if you're producing something and nike's paying a large percentage of it and you have a picture to show one nike one adidas like, let's say you're doing one on college sports. So there's a Baylor and a Tech, which Tech is Under Armour. Which picture are you going to show? And if it's a story about Baylor, then you're going to show the Baylor picture. If it's a story about Tech, you're going to show the Tech picture. But now if it's a picture, a, sh- a story about the Big 12, let's show Baylor. Um, because it's the yeah, thing. Yeah, I, I don't know. I'm not, I'm, not, I'm not really buying what you're selling here. Uh, I think it's just, I think it's a byproduct of Nike, which in 2020 alone spent $3.6 billion on a global advertising so this is just nike being nike and getting its brand everywhere and it's just i mean this is what they're paying for they're paying 3.6 billion dollars so when people choose a photo and post it on the athletic or axios of a sports team it probably has a nike logo next to it i agree with that and that's how a lot of the subliminal advertising works yeah i just i just yeah. i just don't i i think we just need to be clear that the athletic is probably not a beneficiary of of Nike. Nike. Nike's benefici- yeah. beneficiary of just its logo being everywhere. Oh, absolutely, absolutely. But like I said, as long as the the merger stays fair and balanced, I'm I'm all for it. Um, because nothing nothing drives me crazier as a sports fan than than, than listening to them broadcast, especially during March Madness, where they yeah. they clearly have a bias. <laughs> Yeah. And and we can even talk about the NHL and the and the ref that got caught with the high, hot mic hot saying, mic, yeah. "Yeah, I wanted to I wanted to call a foul foul to make the fouls equal." And he got fired. He got fired. Yes. But but here's the deal. Here's what I'm encouraged about. I think The Athletic is a very innovative company in the sports space, and I think Axios is a very innovative company in the news space. And I think if you can have two brilliant businesses working together, I think it's good. I think it forces competition. I think it forces companies like Wall Street Journal, New York Times, Houston Chronicle to maybe rethink their business model and to figure out. Because at the end of the day, you're going to support businesses that you think do something well. And And I'm a subscriber to The Athletic because I like the reporters. I like the content that I get. And I have subscribed to the Axios newsletter as well. And so if Axios does a subscription model... I would probably consider subscribing to Axios as well. I agree. Uh, one of the things I think is really interesting about it is, it, and it's not just, you know, the print media and things. It's it's also the CNNs and the Fox News because Axios has really good information. And I like the fact that, you know, that if they're con- combining the sports along with it, that's competition also for your CNNs. And, and, and your foxes and all the other you know streaming channels as well. So that's kind of how I'm looking at it too. But it's interesting because Axios does have a daily, weekly email blast of the top ten things you need to know about what's going on in sports. Um, yeah, written in the same style that's going on, everything like that. Um, but yeah, to your point, I'm I'm a huge fan of these these different new ways of consuming media. Like I you know I read Axios every morning. Um, I read the hustle every morning and I read the morning brew every morning. Just it, it's quick. It's easy. Less than five minutes. I, I have enough to know what what's going on in the world. And, you know, it's a big story when all of them are covering it. And I, I'd be mm-hmm. curious to hear what our listeners subscribe to. What is your routine when you wake up in the morning? You know, uh, for me, it's checking Twitter, reading the news. You know, I usually see articles that Thomas or Hattie sent to the group thread or uh, to the Gmail account. I'll, I'll read those in the morning. You know, try to spend 30 minutes just catching up on what I missed. You know, essentially over the last 12 hours while I was asleep. Um, so, yeah, it, let us know what you subscribe to. <laughs> Just kidding. I don't sleep 12 hours. But <laughs> That's why I was laughing. <laughs> I was like, you don't sleep 12 hours. Yeah. Uh, I don't it's, sleep 12 it, hours. It's more like four, five hours, somewhere in that range at most. But uh, let us know what you subscribe to. Like, what what do you what's your morning routine like what 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 publications do you look at drop them in the comments below or hit us up on social media just search at biz communicator for that but in terms of social media 
it's been an absolutely wild, wild last two weeks. And on, on this podcast, we've been very open about, I guess, our fandom and our admiration of David Dobrik. And David Dobrik, if you're not familiar with him, he has a ton of followers, millions and millions of followers across all of his different platforms. And uh, he's been brilliant in terms of brand partnerships, in terms of creating that viral moment, guerrilla marketing. But he's under fire. Him and his vlog squad are essentially being, I don't want to use the term canceled, but they're essentially being canceled right now after allegations that have been made against one of his ex-members of the Vlad squad uh, for sexual assault and potentially releasing a video that, uh, you know, didn't show the assault, but it alluded to it. And uh, this video was, I guess, filmed in 2018, and it was removed probably about six months later. Uh something that had kind of been swept under the rug. The person who was accused was not David Dobrik. It was one of his friends, actually, Dom, who they call Dirty Dom. And uh, as a result, David Dobrik has been demonetized by YouTube temporarily. So all of his platforms, that includes his podcast, anything that lives on Google or YouTube platforms has been demonetized. So he's not getting any ad revenue or AdSense from any of the content that he posts. And all of his sponsors, SeatGeek, Chipotle, gone. All of his sponsors. So a guy that just bought a $9 million house in, in California, who was probably making 20 to $30 million a year through his brand deals and through his content, gone overnight. He did release a video statement last week apologizing. Uh, it, it seems that it was very... Heart, heartfelt uh, and raw. He said that he wants to apologize to the woman and her friends for ever putting them in an environment that he enabled that made them feel like their safety and values were compromised and that he was so sorry. So, um, yeah, very interesting situation to follow here with YouTube and David Dobrik, one of the biggest stars. But this is the first controversy we've seen with, with YouTubers. I mean, we look over... You know, the past two to three years, we've seen controversies with Jake and Logan Paul, Jeffree Star, James Charles. And my question to you guys is, a lot of these these YouTubers, they have a lot of uh, yes people behind them. And they might not surround themselves with the right business or HR teams or, or things like that because they're trying to create that viral moment. And sometimes it can backfire. And we've seen it backfire here with David Dobrik. When you and I are talking offline uh, about this, I think there's two things that went through my mind. One was as quickly as all the sponsors started to back out, which rightfully so, especially if any of the allegations are true, just a smidget true, they should be backing out. But it's just how quickly they just like, nope, 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 nope. Started to wonder if some of these contracts were really, really inflated. And they were like, hey, we're spending a whole lot of money. We're not getting a lot of return in it. So so is so that so is it almost like hey, this happened? Thanks for thanks for playing. We're out. But then the other part of it is is yeah. It's, even if it's a smidget of it is true, it's there. But you know he's made lots and lots and lots of money prior, so he's gonna reinvent himself. But this is always the challenge with YouTube stars or any spokesperson. Subway with Jared comes to mind. Um, the Dell guy for some of your older people, you're getting a Dell is that when you put people and make them the spokesperson of your company or your product or anything, you better really hope you have all your ducks in a row. Yeah, do do your due diligence and researching. But, you know, just to provide more context on the David Dobrik, uh, this is an article from the, the Daily Beast. And uh, it says that the woman under the pseudonym Hannah said that November 2018, she and her friends were invited to... Um, by a Dirty Dom to meet him and Dobrik at an apartment where she was illegally given alcohol. I think she was 20 years old or 19 years old. Uh, Dobrik filmed the events of the night, including Hannah entering Dirty Dom's bedroom when she engaged in drunk group sex. Dobrik posted an edited version of the encounter to YouTube in a video titled, She Shouldn't Have Played With Fire. 
He eventually deleted the video at the woman's request, but it had already been viewed five million times. Since the article was published, several brands, including Dollar Shave Club, DoorDash, Chipotle, EA Sports, Frank's Red Hot, SeatGeek, and Honey have cut ties with Dobrik. And as of Monday, Dobrik announced that he was stepping down from the board of Dispo, which is a disposable camera app that he founded to not distract from the company's growth. And that has already been downloaded. I think I think he's lost like something like 66 million views or something like that since um, since this has happened. So, you know, although he did issue an apology, it's still going to have long term ramifications. I know he's young. He's still in his mid 20s, but he was labeled as Gen Z's version of Jimmy Fallon. And so how do you I mean, what's next for for Dobrik? (laughs) First of all, get you a good attorney. And find you a good crisis counsel. One of the things I, I love that we have all these folks out here who are finding these wonderful ways to make money online and things such as that. But when it comes to the business end of it, they're not getting um, the right people who can help them from the back end. Whether it's crisis uh, communications, whether it's crisis, he only apologized after he got caught. And he's not the only person. They're all apologizing after the fact. And they're also because they're losing money at the same time. Everybody's getting behind the crisis versus getting ahead of the crisis. Um, Like you said, this video has been out there a while, since 2018. And not once did he think about what the consequences were going to be of that. Nor did he have anyone counseling him in terms of, gee, you know, Dave, maybe that's not the right thing you done, You should have done. Or, as you said, the person requested had to request that he took it down. Being young and on top of, I hate to use the word stupid, is just, I, I, don't, I don't get it. These little young kids need to get a clue. But you need, basically, just get the right people in mind. Crises are happening every single day. Yeah, and I mean, he removed the video after six months. It already gotten five million views, but he, he, he knew that after six months when the video was, you know, when he removed it on her request that he should he should have probably thought, all right, I screwed up big time. This is, now, this that, is early, that was a this is early 2019, probably when he removed the videos. So mm-hmm. the problem is like, this is coming out two years later, two and a half years later. It's like he had time to game plan, and get out in front of this. Uh, he didn't him. care. He did so, not care. So here's the question. The the video was up for six months, five million views. Out of that five million views, how much revenue did he make off of that? And if so, did he give it to the young lady? Or all the people that became subscribers that made that he made money? That would probably be about the only way that you could possibly even somewhat come close to salvaging David Dobrik's thing. You can't salvage that, Thomas. But, but, I disagree no, with I, that. No, no, I also, I'm just... in within those six months, there was nobody on his team within the whole six months of that being up and getting the views. Oh, Dave, you know what? I don't think this is right. Uh, this could be a potential lawsuit. Dave, no one said, there is no way you can salvage this. I 100% agree, but what I'm saying is is that those 5 million views, let's just do easy math. If each one of those is worth 50 cents, that's $2.5 million that, that you pretty much built your reputation on this poor lady's unfortunate stupidity actions from him and his friends. He was equally stupid. Mm-hmm. Uh, stupid is equal all the way across. And no, you know he did not give her any of that money. No, but, but, but he's but going I'm to. I wonder how much money he made off of it. Yeah, he's he's. This isn't the last we've heard about the, about this situation. You know, it, the, the, there's still going to be more fallout, um, and I wouldn't be surprised to see you know more people come forward. That's generally what happens when these situations occur. He had his 15 minutes of fame, and I believe he's if he makes a if he can make a comeback. Yay for you, but if not, I don't feel bad yeah. for him. No, yeah, I don't feel sixty-six million dollars a year in revenue that you made off of other people's backs. No, I don't. I'm not gonna. Th- us talking about it this long is already like one of those things. Yeah. I'm like, why? Well, on that note, let's go ahead and wrap up the show with one of our favorite subjects, and that's our writing prompts. So we've got the book 
400 writing prompts where we do a little extemporaneous speaking, little conversations, try to end on a positive note. And of course, we want you to leave your comments uh, below and we'll share the best on next week's episode of the podcast. But Hattie, tell me when to stop. Stop. All right. Thomas, left Seven. or right? What? Oh, right. <laughs> you usually make me say a number and I was like, let's throw, let's throw you for a loop here. <laughs> All right. Hattie, one, two, or three. Two. All right. The question. What is something recurring on your to-do list? And why are you putting it off? What is something recurring on your to-do list? And why are you putting it off? All right, Austin. You're going to go first because you always put us on the spot first. And you always answer last. So now we're going to flip the script on you. (laughs) You go first on this one. Sound fair, Hattie? Since you said it, yeah. (laughs) (laughs) Air hug. <laughs> Something on my to-do list that I put it off. Gosh. Uh, you know, that's that's tough. I mean, most of the stuff that I that I put on my to-do list is usually, like, work-related. I would probably say, like, grocery shopping. I mean, to be honest. <laughs> like, <laughs> I mean, it's just with the convenience factor of, like, Uber Eats or something like that. You're like, oh, I... I I'll just go tomorrow. Then, you know, you order like Uber Eats or DoorDash or something like that. So, yeah, I would say going to the grocery store is probably something that I put off too much. But with with all that said, it would it would come down to like eating healthy and not uh, going the quick option. Um, You know, I, I think sometimes we look at convenience as more of a benefit than actually, you know, spending on hour and a half two hours on like a sunday meal prepping or something like that so that would probably be it for me but hattie what about you uh putting a um planting some flower beds in my backyard why am i putting it off i'm just lazy <laughs> what kind of flowers are going out there i mean it's springtime well i was at um i was actually at lowe's this morning i love lowe's and like it's the mall. That's not a sponsor. Um, That's not a sponsor. <laughs> but if you want a sponsor, please yeah. reach Lowe's, out to us. if you us want a sponsor, reach out to Hattie. <laughs> I wasn't, hey, this is my loyalty, okay? Uh, I was there this morning and I saw these beautiful um, just flowers, as they, whatever they were. And I said they were purple, which is my favorite color. And I said, you know, I should get some of these and take them back and just start planting them. I said, Nah, I'm not going to do that. I just don't feel it today. Fair enough. Fair enough. Thomas, what what what, what about you? What's on your to-do list that uh, still needs to be checked off? Starting writing a book. Uh, no, but in reality, just basic cleaning up after myself. Um, whether You're it's a slob. Grocery store or doing You're... The, I, I'm not really a slob, but I think yes, I Yes, you are. Cleaner. Okay, well, I have two kids, so yes, I'm a huge don't slob. Put it, don't blame those children. I cannot wait till they grow up. Are we recording this? Yes. I'm going to let them hear Yes, and I'm going to record it. I'm going to show it to them on their 18th birthday or when I go visit them. And, and I'm going to say, oh, you know, your dad blamed you for everything. We've got Not the receipts. Everything. We've just got for being, the receipts. Just for putting stuff all over the place. <laughs> you are um, sad, sad, sad. But, but it's interesting because... I think this topic is almost perfect because earlier this week I was reading an article about how to take different things of of engineering and and putting it into your normal everyday life. And what it was saying was about the the amount of energies you expel doing just certain menial tasks and how you're like, oh, that's not that's that's not enough energy to bend over and pick up your shoes and put them away. But then over time, those small little energies that you have to use of the menial task become one massive one that you just don't want to do at all. And, and I was sitting there and I was reading it and of course then I had to go down that rabbit hole and um, watch a bunch of YouTube videos that have nothing to do with that, but that's another another statement. I finally got off my TikTok, so we're, we're, we're back to somewhat normal on that one. But but it, it really started making me think about, you know, um, just doing those little things is that if you're already walking into the bedroom, pick up the shoes as you walk in there. Uh, you know, putting your dishes in the dishwasher versus just leaving them in the sink for the Till, till another dish or another dish or another dish. Um, and, and so so it's really that kind of thing um, is, is really what things I'm putting off is, is, is it's the hardest thing is that first step. And so when I say, you know, I've been wanting to write a book and I've been saying it about for about three years, hey, I want to write a book, I want to write a book, I want to write a book. Putting that first pen to paper is the hardest step and I just have not done it. And I don't know why, 
maybe it's deep down inside I'm scared that you know writing a book and putting myself out there but that's that's really what it boils down to it is is as trying to do those small things every day just to pick up after one after another well we would we want to hear from you what are things that are on your to-do list that uh you're just waiting to check off let us know in the comments below or hit us up on social media at biz communicator if you want text us text uh Text us what you are putting off, and the number to do that is 713-360-0133. Uh, but, you know, Thomas Hattie, it's been, a, it's been a lot of fun just catching up with you guys, as always. And, of course, this show would not be possible without the, uh, the support of our partners, and that's Pierpont Communications, Mike Krantz & Co., and IBC Houston. And we couldn't thank them enough for supporting this podcast. And we want to thank all of our listeners. Also, thanks to Carol Meyer, Miner for winning the prize you will be getting a goodie bag from the business communicators heading your way shortly. But before we wrap up, Hattie, Thomas, any, uh, any parting words for the crowd this week? Have a good week. Um, <laughs> Not really. <laughs> have a good work week. Uh, something that's made me very humble lately is uh, watching a little bit of the golf and hearing about a professional hitting a golf ball into someone's backyard swimming pool. And then hearing um, about uh, the, the, the guy who's just hitting this golf ball 450 yards off the tee to Chambrio, hitting a 46-yard, 49-yard drive. I relate to him because that's about where my drives wind up more often than not in the other guy. It gives me pause to think that even though professionals do it way better than I do, 99.9999% of the time, they still are human. Yeah. And so with that, be good to each other. Cut everybody slack and do your best. Bryson DeChambeau is so much fun to watch. And Rory McIlroy going into the swimming pool. I've been there. I've done that before. Uh, Thomas actually <laughs> texted me and he was like, oh, yeah, does this look familiar? And I was like, no, <laughs> sorry, my ball goes right. It doesn't go left. I was like, I usually I usually have this giant like sweeping slice. So that that's definitely not me. I don't I don't do the hook shots. But uh, but with that said, I think Thomas Hattie and I, we need to get together. We need to go to Top Golf for our next outing. I think that'd be a lot of fun. But uh, it's been fun, of course, as always, recording with you guys on this episode of the Business Communicators. And, of course, we want to thank our listeners for supporting the show. And just please continue to do so. Share the podcast if you enjoy it. Interact with us on social media. Just search at Biz Communicators on all of our platforms. And uh, we did mention last week that we have the interview coming with Daniel Vaughn from Texas Monthly. We had to actually reschedule that interview because he's going on a three-day barbecue tour and it's going to be published in Texas Monthly, so we're like super jealous of that. So we will have Daniel on our episode that drops on April 12th, which we hope that you enjoy. But it's been a fun week. We hope that you have an amazing week, and hopefully my Baylor Bears are still in March Madness in the NCAA tournament. But on behalf of my co-host, Hattie Horn and Thomas Bain, my name's Austin Statton. We'll see you next week. You've been listening to The Business Communicators. If you haven't done so already... Be sure to subscribe to our podcast on iTunes and leave us a five-star review.